Hello everybody, I want to start today by saying a huge thank you to everyone who tuned into my piece talking about Carfection and the mechanics of making YouTube videos. As a bit of a follow on from that, here is another piece of content that many of you have been requesting. In this video, I'm going to be talking you through all of the film equipment that I use to create my content. I'm afraid there won't be many cars today, but I hope you'll enjoy it nonetheless. <laughs> So, where to begin? Well, I think I'll start with two pieces of equipment that are often overlooked. First off, the humble camera bag. This one is mine. It's new to me. It's a Think Tank Airport Security 3, and I chose it for a number of reasons. First off, my old Low Pro 35 backpack had seen better days and was beginning to fall apart at the seams, quite literally. Secondly, I had acquired some new kit and it simply wasn't big enough. But there's more to a bag than simply big or small. Some of the reasons that I chose this include the fact it's great for taking through airports. As you might imagine from the name, it's designed for that purpose. So it's more or less exactly the correct size to fit on just about any major airlines carry on restrictions. You're not going to get it on Ryanair or EasyJet, but it also has an integrated handle like so, so I can wheel it through airports. Very handy when you're doing long distances and when the bag has been fully laden. You've got a laptop pouch in the front. So with all my stuff in here, this is about 18 kilos. It's not particularly light or nice to carry around. Just about everybody will have a bag of this size. And that means it's a fairly handy reference point because when I'm testing cars, I will put the same kit in the boot every single time. So when I'm testing a car, it gives me a fairly good idea of how generous the boot is or isn't. And when you're watching the video, you can look at it and go, hmm, that bag's been totally swallowed by the back of that car, so it must be fairly generous. Or you'd look at, say, a Lamborghini Aventador and go, hmm, well, you've put this in the front and, uh, that's the whole thing taken up, so therefore it's not very good for storage. Having this being a uniform size and you know easy to recognize, I think is fairly important. My full shooting kit actually comprises three bags. There's this, which contains all of the expensive, easily breakable stuff. There's also a green Lotus Holdall, which I've had for years now, and that carries all the stuff like this, which is a little bit more robust. And finally, my tripod bag. Between the three of those, I've got just about everything I would need for nearly any conceivable shooting scenario. The second piece of kit, again often overlooked, is the tripod. And I will confess here I have gone somewhat overboard. Now tripods come in two parts, the legs and the head. Fairly easy to work out which is which. The legs that I use are Manfrotto 535 carbon fiber items. They're nice, they're lightweight. You do have to be cautious because they are easy to break if you lay anything heavy on top of them, but they're pretty decent and fairly versatile. Then the head is definitely over spec. That's a Zackler DV6 SB. As far as I was concerned, this was very much a downgrade. I liked Zackler stuff because in my previous career, I'd always used their stuff. I had a Zackler Studio 9 Plus 9 for anyone interested, and that's a head that can carry cameras weighing up to about 50 kilos. Obviously, far more than I need today. But the DV6 SB has been a faithful companion and will likely keep going for a while, but I'm thinking of retiring it for daily duty soon and buying something a little more appropriate and a bit more compact. So, Moving on from that then, what do I have in terms of cameras? Well, there's two main ones. The A-cam is the one that you're currently watching me via, which is a Panasonic Lumix S1H. I haven't always used a Panasonic kit. Prior to this, I had the S5, which I'll talk about in a bit. Before that, I had the Panasonic GH5, which is easily one of the best cameras that I've owned. And if you're looking at starting in YouTube, I'd say that's a pretty good point. It may be a few years old now, but it does just about everything most people really need. The first camera I had was a Sony A7S II. One of the reasons that I stopped using that was it lacked a fairly basic feature. There was no fold out screen. So when you're in a car trying to sort of get focus on yourself and sort the shot out, if you're on your own, you've no idea what's going on. There was a, a lot of guesswork involved and more often than not, things didn't quite go to plan. It also didn't have in-camera stabilization, which meant that for certain videos with particular cars, say Caterhams or any sort of convertible with bad scuttle shake, the picture quality just wasn't good enough. The camera was getting shaken around a lot. I was also building the camera up and it was getting to the point where it was getting a little bit heavy and I just didn't like that. You also had issues with the A7S because I was using multiple lenses and every time you take a lens off and put on a camera, you do run the risk of getting dirt and dust and things in 
inside the camera onto the sensor and that creates black spots and things which did afflict some of my early videos in quite a significant way. So the GH5 I was told was absolutely brilliant and that turned out to be the case. Though because of its micro four thirds sensor it didn't have the same depth of field as I get with these cameras, the picture quality was very good, there were lots of functions about it that I really liked, though a few things that I didn't. One in particular that always irked me was when you had the camera in shutter priority mode, it didn't tell you what aperture setting it was using. So you had no idea really whether you wanted to use an ND filter or not. We'll talk about those a little bit more in a bit if you don't understand what it is that I'm rabbiting on about. However, I really loved the GH5. I only ever had one lens for it, a 12 to 60 Leica, which meant you never got any dust or dirt in it. And though certain things like using slow motion weren't that easy and couldn't be done at the same resolution as regular video, it was great. The codec was fantastic, good camera, and clearly very much designed for the video user. Having had the GH5 for quite a while and being really fairly happy with it, I felt it was time to upgrade and I wanted to stay in the land of Panasonic. So I bought this, the S5, which should have been everything about the GH5 that I liked and a little bit more. This, unlike the GH5, is not micro four thirds, it's a full frame sensor. In other words, it's about twice the size, much, much bigger. So much higher quality of picture, you can get more pixels in for the same amount of space and you also have some other functions too. Now the camera itself is actually, I think, a fraction smaller than the GH5. It really is quite tiny. The, the, the body itself is, is just that, it's not big. But despite the fact that the picture quality is generally very, very good, there are some issues. In their finite wisdom, Panasonic decided not to fit this camera with an aliasing filter or optical low pass filter. Now what that does in camera parlance is essentially, it's a bit of a blur on the sensor, which might sound really odd. Why would you want to do that? Well, because if you allow a camera to just get the unfiltered image, some funny things can happen. Patterns can appear that don't really exist in the real world. As to why, that's fairly boring and we don't need to explain that today. But the fact is, most cameras have a low pass filter and Panasonic decided to do without. This is something that the stills world started doing a little while back and Panasonic have been quite keen on it. I really, really don't like it. What it does is make your photos look higher resolution because you've removed this sort of layering of blur, but for video, it creates a lot of issues. And I've had a huge amount of trouble with this camera. That being said, there are some things about it that I really like. I like the colors out of it, though I do prefer the Sony ones. And most importantly, with the S5 in particular, there's a little dial up here that you get on all professional cameras, but there's a setting for slow and quick. So I could shoot normal speed stuff, talking heads, all that sort of stuff, yada, 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 all fine. If I wanna then do some slow motion stuff, like all the shots you've been seeing of the cameras, all of the exterior shots you see of cars, static shots, that kind of stuff, you just click this wheel around and then you've got your slow motion. When doing slow motion mode, it doesn't use all of the sensor. And you can do that with the other camera. I was, I was looking for it and I've been talking to it. But the problem is to do what on here is one click on that takes several button presses. And that gets boring and really annoying really fast. I want to be able to change a eh? normal speed, slow motion, normal, slow motion, dead easy, dead simple. I really like that. The screen is also nice and bright. That was an issue I had with the GH5. The screen goes quite dark quite quickly, making it quite hard to see. Um, but yeah, that still works. Every now and again, you will still see footage from the GH5. My interview with Steve Nichols, the McLaren MP44 piece that I did, that's because my buddy Anthony from Sports and Touring comes along and he's got my old GH5. So the footage does still cut fairly nicely and there are lots and lots of benefits to still having that smaller camera. I wish actually I hadn't sold it, but I had to, to buy this because these are expensive. So this camera body, I think was about 1800 pounds or so. This lens, this is a Panasonic Lumix S Pro and almost all of the shots you've seen recently of static cars, cars going by, will have been shot on this. This lens is about 2000 pounds. On top here, we have a microphone, might as well talk about that while I'm here. This is a Rode Stereo Video Mic Pro and this is what I use just for drive-by shots. I don't use this for anything else. So doing drive-by shots, this is the setup that I use. So I got this after the GH5 and really I was quite disappointed with it. Sure, some things were better, but a lot of things were not. The Moire issue that I've already discussed, the patterns that appear out of nowhere, and the fact that it isn't really very subtle when it alters exposure. You can see it stepping, it's bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark. And that's really, really quite distracting and shouldn't happen. Didn't happen on the GH5, didn't happen on my old Sony. So I thought, right, 
I need to fix this. And everyone had told me, right, if you get the S1H, that should not do it. My first thought actually was to go back to Sony, but the new version of what I'd had, the A7S 3 did fix a lot of issues. It had a flip out screen and all that stuff, but it was also really, really expensive, nearly £4,000. And as I'd already invested in lenses and all sorts of stuff for the Panasonic, I didn't want to change the entire ecosystem. So I thought, okay, I'll buy the S1H, which I did, and see how I got on. Happily, it was actually pretty decent, though it does still exhibit a few issues that I've mentioned. They're not anywhere near as bad as on the S5. And it does have a few nice professional features that I really appreciate. So it's got a little display on top that is always active, as long as the camera's got a battery in it, telling you how much memory card space you've got, how much battery you've got. So you can look at the camera even when it's off and go, okay, yeah, I need to put a battery in that, or I need to put a memory card in that, or something like that. You'll also notice on real professional cameras that you can't accidentally change the mode. You've got to hold the button and do other stuff, which seems fiddly at first, but you do begin to appreciate pretty quickly. And it's similar resolution, similar codecs, all that sort of stuff compared with the S5. So when I'm cutting footage on my software, it'll all work together very nicely. The downside though, as you might expect, is that the S1H was not cheap. It cost me for the body only, 2,800 pounds. That's before you've added things like batteries. And one of the annoyances of these cameras is that batteries seem to change every five minutes. So that camera and that camera look the same. That's the battery for one, that's the battery for the other. That unsurprisingly is for the S1H, the more professional camera. Now I suspect they had to make a new battery because this wouldn't fit in that. Handily, it means that the S1H does last a little bit longer, but it also means you need a different charger and everything else, and it gets really expensive really quickly. When it comes to batteries, incidentally, for the big cameras, I only ever buy genuine, and they can be expensive. The S5 I got when it was a new camera, and these were about 70 to 80 pounds each, and I'll have at least three or four for each camera, because that's really what you need for a day's shooting. For in-car shots, I previously used a Sigma Prime lens. The Panasonic cameras used a new mount called L, which means that the selection of glass is not as good as some other brands. However, when I bought the S1H, I sold the Sigma as it was partly responsible for my exposure issues, and I got a Lumix S Pro 16-35 f4. The benefits of this were that it matched the look of the 24-70 I was already using for the statics and drive-bys. It was a zoom, so made it easier to get the shot size I wanted in cars. 16mm is very wide, so even in something like an Exige, I can still get the perfect frame size. And investing in good glass is always wise. Any photographer or videographer will tell you they're far more important than the camera, because generally they'll last a lot longer. This lens set me back about £1,500. Just a reminder, if you're interested in buying any of the kit shown today, I've put affiliate links in the description down below, so if you want to buy something, please use one of those, and I'll get a few quid back. Thanks in advance. So then, on to the action cameras, and this is where it gets quite interesting. I use presently, almost exclusively, Sony products. I've always loved Sony cameras. They do things in a slightly odd way, their own way, but very often I've found that I agree with their principles and ideas. Unfortunately, as I'll explain in a little bit, there are a few issues. Now, you may recognize some of these cameras because I'm not the only YouTuber who uses them. I know that Shmi and Harry Metcalf are also fans of the Sonys. I know when it comes to action cameras, the brand many people will default to is GoPro, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with them. In fact, if you're starting out, I'd actually say a GoPro is a fairly solid choice. The cameras are excellent, the picture quality is fantastic, they have many different modes, a huge amount of accessories, available to you, you can do some incredible things with them. But for me, I don't really bother with much of that stuff. In fact, only one of my action cams has image stabilization. But these I like because they deliver a good picture, they're not fussy, they're not fancy, your memory card and battery go in the back, they come out, plug into the computer, I download the file, it's nice, high quality, it's the same codec as my old Sony camera used to be, so from an edit perspective, that was another benefit too and I like how they attach. So with these, you just have a simple screw thread in the bottom. GoPros have this needlessly complex system where they have sort of two little folds like that with holes in and you put a screw through. So there's an extra point of articulation going on and it's just, 
It's just weird. I, I don't like it. I, I never have. It also means it's really quite easy to lose the little important screw that you need to attach it to everything else. And it's a way of kind of locking it into that ecosystem. A bit like Apple. I don't like any camera or any piece of technology that tries to be proprietary and, and GoPro's mounting system is that. Sure, it's really well supported and there's loads of stuff and if you're a beginner, a GoPro probably is going to be the best choice but for me, I don't care about any of the stuff it offers, I just want the basic decent stuff that you get from one of these. So the cameras I have are two different flavour of Sony action cam. This one is what I use to strap to the front of the car. This is the shot that's really low to the ground, the one where you don't really see much of the car. This is an X3000V. The rest of them are X1000Vs. The only real difference is that this has optical image stabilisation and this doesn't. There are some other changes, but practically speaking, picture quality is the same. Most importantly, batteries are the same, codec is the same, like, you, you can never tell. The difference. If I set these up the same, you simply would not know which picture came from which camera. This one has a, a little armor housing around it, which is kind of nice to have. That's how it comes. And these also do all have, if you want to, a little waterproof housing as well. I basically never use this. Uh, one reason I don't use this is because it makes the sound really, really funky. And for most of the cameras, that's not an issue, but for the exhaust cam, it is. Um, and it's just an extra layer of complication to get the camera out and you have to do all that sort of stuff which when you've got you know half a dozen cameras that can become tedious really really quickly and you know and that being said the reason that this particular camera lives in here is uh these do have a hard life they they don't last forever and um the one that's inside here has started to fall apart so by having it inside its waterproof housing it, it continues to live on now, a couple of these cameras I have actually made some subtle modifications to. This one is what I use for my exhaust noise. It's the scraggliest looking of all my cameras. The damage on it, I did not do. I bought this like it, but the picture quality is absolutely fine. And uh, what I've done is just attach a small little wind jammer here. It's glued down and it just removes a little bit of wind noise. I have often thought about buying a microphone specifically for my exhaust shots, but there's a couple of reasons I've never bothered. First off, generally speaking, the sound out of this is pretty good. Having a dedicated microphone, I don't think would have made things any better. Secondly, you can have a microphone in place, but you then need a recorder for it. And mounting one of these is easy, but mounting a recorder for a microphone may not be. You probably need to wire it into the boot and then you've got to make sure it doesn't sort of, you know, roll around and go places because it'll potentially disconnect the cable or break it. And um, it's just complicated. Plus, these are reasonably cheap. Most of these action cams I bought on eBay used for just under £200. The X3000 costs a tiny bit more. Uh, new, the X3000 would have been, I think these are about 5 odd hundred quid, and these are about 350 You can get some interesting accessories. There's a little wristband with a screen on it that you can use to control the cameras. But the problem is, once you've got multiple of them, apps and wristband controllers and all that sort of stuff, just go out the window. I turn these on press stop, press go, whatever. They don't even have a screen where you can actually see the picture. You don't need it. These have such a wide angle of view that they're like that. They're like nearly 180 degrees that you just, you just look down it, aim it like a gun. That's how I do it. This one is different. This one I've put a different lens onto. Now, I, I think I looked into this because one of my cameras did eventually wind up with a cracked lens from a stone that hit it or, or something like that. But this has the benefit of altering the field of view. One of the things that I don't like about action cameras in general is that they nearly all have these super wide lenses and that has some benefits, but it also means getting the shots that you want isn't always easy to do. So this has a lens from a company called Rage Cams and it means that rather than getting a field view like that, you get a field view like that. In fact, I've got footage to show you. So this is from a camera with a wide original lens and this is from a camera with a tighter lens. Big difference, isn't there? And this wasn't expensive to do. It's just over 100 quid or so per camera, and the picture quality is really, really good. It's a bit fiddly to set up. Once it's done, it's, it's set. You never have to worry about it, and I quite like that. Then the newest member of the camera family is this. It's a Sony ZV-1. It's a vlogging camera that I originally bought for my other half. It's also been modified slightly by uh, fitting a little filter thread on the front so I can put polarized lenses on it. And the reason that I've done that is because this is the camera that has been responsible for some of the shots that I know a few of you have noticed I've been doing recently. The one on the bonnet where you can actually see me. 
There's a few reasons this works better than these. The main one is that polarizing filter. And a polarizer essentially can get rid of reflections if you set it up correctly, so you can see into the car a little bit easier. It also has a zoom lens on it, so you can get the shot that you want. But there are some drawbacks, one being that there is a limit to how much these can record. In 1080p mode, they'll go as long as you like, but in 4K mode, this turns itself off after five minutes. Now you can override that, and you can essentially say, look, record as long as you can until you overheat. In normal situations, that probably would be a little bit risky. You may damage the camera after you know, long-term overheating. But I had an idea that thus far has proven to be correct, which is that when I'm filming, these are outside a car. So they've got the wind going over them at 50, 60 mile an hour, which means they're not going to overheat. And actually, weirdly, though they use the same battery, this camera can sometimes last a little bit longer than these. When it comes to batteries for the small ones, they're Sony NP-BX1s. I have a variety of different batteries. Unlike the big cameras though, I don't care about having genuine ones. I buy batteries off Amazon from a company called Numoa because I get three batteries and a charger for about 20 quid or something daft like that. And they last just as long. What I do if I suspect a battery is bad or a memory card, if you've come back from a shoot and one camera has died and the rest are still going, if I think that camera has died before its time, you get about 45 minutes or so record time out of these with 4K, it's one of my criticisms, it's not quite long enough for me, but you know, just put a little cross over it. So if the camera or battery or whatever's misbehaved once, just a little cross with a Sharpie, and then maybe it's my fault, maybe I didn't charge it properly, you know, there's a hundred reasons why this might not have worked. So you then just go, okay, cross through it, then you just carry on using it as normal. Next time you go to film, if the camera died early, you take the battery out and it's got a cross on it, you know there is a fault with that battery. And then, in the bin. All of my kit, all of my kit, it has a hard life. I'll spend the money on it and I'll maintain it, but if it starts to misbehave, it simply doesn't make any economic sense to keep it going. When the cameras get to a point where they're no longer viable or they're misbehaving or they're you know, ruining shots, they go, they just go. Unfortunately, these cameras are no longer available. Sony discontinued them back in 2020. And though I would love to say, I'll just start replacing them with stuff like this, first off, this is a bigger, heavier, different style of camera that won't necessarily last for quite as long as these, and it's not designed to be used for the same stuff as these. But where I was paying 200 quid for these, this is 700 pounds. So obviously, I'm a little bit more concerned about what might happen if this were to get damaged, if a rock were to hit it or something like that. Cameras, by the way, generally don't fall off cars. I'll explain why in a bit, but that's not cheap. I do still occasionally find these for sale on eBay, and if they come up at a reasonable price, I will try and buy them. However, today, a lot of people are asking unreasonable prices. I am in the process of trying to find a suitable replacement for these. One potential alternative comes from Insta360. Now, my friend Anthony from Sports and Touring has been using Insta360 cameras for quite a while. He used their One X2, which is their classic 360 camera, but they also have a new camera that I'm quite interested in. That's the Insta360 One RS. They do a couple of different versions. One of them has a one inch sensor, which is quite like this, so much bigger than these do, and in theory, that means better picture quality, so on and so forth. It also has some nice accessories, like a bigger battery pack that really would be very handy for me. I have yet to get my hands on the One RS one inch, but I have tried the regular One RS, and I would say the footage is fairly comparable to one of these. There's a few things I like and prefer about the Insta360, there's a few things that I don't like about it and prefer about these, but on the whole, I think when it comes to replacing the fleet, I may start moving over to the Insta360s. Now, though it's not really been my style, there are some things you can achieve with the Insta360 cameras that are simply impossible with these. And if you want to see a little bit more about that and how shots like this are made, check out my friend Anthony's video on just that. And if you'd like to see how these cameras are actually used in the real world, my friend Anthony has also made a couple of videos on just that topic for our joint channel, JM and Friends. One was on the MK Indy and another on the Ferrari F355 Challenge. So if you're curious as to exactly how I place the cameras, some of the logic behind it, check out that video. Today I want to make more just about the pure tech. That then leads us neatly onto a discussion about camera mounts. Here I have four different suction mounts that I use, not seen are various clamps and different things that I have that are great for rigging to stuff like aerial atoms, caterums, the MK Indy, anything with a big roll cage, that just use a clamp. But for suction mounts, here's the stuff that I use. Now, many people will use something like this. If you're thinking, by the way, about using a GoPro uh, rig, GoPro mount, 
for which GoPro say, don't put it on the outside of a car. Don't put it on the outside of a car. There's a reason they tell you don't do it. This is a Delkin Fat Gecko. It's a fairly popular thing and comes in a few different configurations. One of them has one foot. This is the twin, which has two, and there's another which has three. I'm not in love with this. I'm really not. It's um, a tricky bit of equipment, to say the least. I don't think it's quite as well made as some of the others, but it does have one party piece. Because it's got these two feet, and I think they're fractionally smaller than some of my other mounts, this can mount in places where other stuff just can't go. So if you can get this set up right and you can get a good purchase with it, it's, uh, it's a decent option to have. There's a reason I keep it around, but this is my second of these, and I would say this just does not last anywhere near as long as all the other stuff that I use. I know other YouTubers out there use these and have absolutely no issues with them whatsoever. Maybe I'm just a bit too hard on my kit, but mm, I'm not in love with it. Use these with caution. The mount I would urge everyone to start off with is this. And here is a perfect demonstration as to why these are so good. I'm actually, this isn't stuck to the table. It has just stuck itself to the table. I'm, I'm seriously, <laughs> I can nearly lift the table. This is not attached, okay? That's how good these things are. I've not even suckered it down or anything and it will lift this table up. So it's a simple, nice mount uh, made by Veribore. Yeah, Veribore. And it's pretty simple, basic. Nice little bit here, little suction cup. Keep that nice and clean. Put it on a nice, clean, flat surface, as flat a piece on the car as you can find. Clamp down like so. And if there's effort, there's force, which means it's suckered. And then honestly, this is not coming off this table like ever. See what I mean? And then camera just screws into here. Nothing extra, no silly GoPro adapters required or anything like that. That's nice and simple. That's as simple as it gets. And I use these more than anything else. If you need something more complicated, particularly for a bonnet shot, I have a few versions of the same thing that then have a bit of articulation on them. So you can mount this however you like. You can set that up so you can do various different bits. And these all come apart. These do different things. So you can, you, you, you get the idea. You can do a lot with that. And then finally, the daddy. This is what goes in the windscreen. This is what supports a camera like that or like this. These mounts, by the way, are way over spec for what I use, but that's the way I like it with suction mounts. If you get it right first time, you must make sure the car is clean, the surface is flat. If you're a bit unsure, use glass. Glass is the best surface to mount these, but it's not always possible for some of your shots. This goes in the windscreen. This is quite cool. So you, a little bit of a, this is how the air gets out. You basically press that and it will sucker itself to the windscreen. Be careful, some cars have a very curved windscreen. Lotus Exige in particular, I'm looking at you, they're a pain. And then this little red line here will tell you that you've got suction. So you can keep an eye on it. So if this starts appearing, that means the suction is failing and that means the camera's gonna fall off. Sometimes getting this off the car can be a devil, I tell you. Keep a credit card with you. You're supposed to do that to break the seal. Once the seal is broken, the thing will just fall off. But it, um, this will hold on. This will hold on for a very, very long time. The only time I ever had an issue with this is when someone had put a sun visor inside the windscreen and I didn't realize, so I'd, I'd suckered it across the sun visor and it stayed on for a good 10 minutes, but obviously the seal wasn't perfect. So it was always going to fail and fall off. That was frustrating. Other bits and bobs you might want to know. Well, ND filters, they're quite handy. These essentially reduce the amount of light, you see, but without really affecting anything else. I hate the way that they measure these. This one is an ND8, which means it lets through one eighth the amount of light that actually started with, you know, so a bit like sunglasses for your camera. Um, I'd buy them off Amazon, best quality ones you can. I like Hoya or Gobe, they're, they're good enough for what I use. Um, so there's an ND8, ND16 with a built-in polar, that sort of stuff. Finally, we're gonna talk about sound recording because that actually is the most important thing of all. Cameras are lovely, but if you can't hear what it is that I have to say, you're not gonna watch what I have to say either. I began with a Rode wireless mic, which is a very nice, decent standard issue piece of kit. It's fairly bulky transmitter pack like so. And for my first, I don't know, 50, 60 videos or so, it was great. Really easy to use, just set your receiver and your transmitter to the same channel and it will sort everything out on its own. Now, I do love RODEKIT and still use some of it, but unfortunately, it just doesn't last all that long. And after about 60 shoots, the road did start to break. And annoyingly, I could never find out what was wrong with it. I sent it off to be repaired. They sent it back and said it was repaired and it wasn't. It record fine for about 10 minutes and then just die. So in the interim, I actually bought 
this, which is a real, real old school kit. These are Sennheiser 100 series G2s. They weren't even new when I bought them six years ago. This is what you'd actually use on a, a proper shoot. These are real nice pieces of kit, very well made, very well engineered. And I actually think of all the stuff that I own, the sound quality is maybe the best. But there is a simple issue with these. They're just not designed for the kind of filmmaking that I do now. These are designed for a sound person to be listening to them all the time. And uh, do be careful, by the way, if you do fancy buying stuff like this, because a few years ago they changed the frequency that this kit works on. Some of it, like this, was updated and works with the new stuff. Some older ones are still set to the old frequency, and they're technically illegal to use. These also cannot be taken all around the world. First off, they're also illegal. Secondly, they just wouldn't work anyway because they're going to try using frequencies that have been reserved for other uses. So, I did use these for a little bit. Love, love the sound quality, but the big problem, if something goes wrong, if there's interference from another source locally, which there can be, particularly in a built-up area, they'll go wrong. And because I'm not monitoring the sound, I have no idea if it's gone wrong until it's far, far too late. So, I actually moved to a system that I was introduced to by my friend Jack from Number 27. It's a tiny little Tascam recorder. This is a built-in recorder and it's fairly simple. You plug your microphone into it, hit record, that's it. It's got a little micro SD card in it, fairly simple. Now on the upside, of course, you don't need to worry about radio signals, pairing stuff, anything like that. The downside, you need to synchronize your audio and your video and you need to remember to turn this on and then off. A few times I've got home to find that I've got a nice recording of the three hours of me driving back to, back to the house with um, Classic FM playing. Yeah, but uh, I retain these as a backup. They're good, they're 200 pounds each and they, they don't come with a microphone. Microphone, by the way, I use Sennheiser ME2s. They're not the cheapest, 120 quid or so I think each, but they're good. Good quality, industry standard, nothing wrong with them. So I had the Tascam for a bit, mostly because I'd stopped trusting wireless kit. However, I was getting a bit annoyed. There was a few times I'd made mistakes, forgotten to turn the Tascam on and everything, or it'd run out of batteries and all that sort of stuff. So I thought, okay, what do I do? I then found a new system called Sennheiser's AVX, and it really was Sennheiser's version of what Rode had been doing previously. So it's a really simple system. It works well enough. It's what you're listening to now. Transmitter, receiver, they're both fairly compact, much smaller than the old G2 stuff. The, the receiver that's on the camera now is like, yay big, I'll show you a picture. And it's great. It lasts, the receiver lasts for like three or four hours. The transmitter lasts for like 12 hours. So make sure you turn it off and, and you'll be fine and uh, it pairs itself. You get a green light on top of each of them, so they're paired, you know they're working. I know that sound is coming through, it's all groovy, and it's also got automatic gain control, so you, you just set it and forget it. Plug the receiver into the camera, plug the microphone into the transmitter, and that's it, that's grand. Recently, I have also added what is called the Sennheiser XSW, and that's very much the same thing, but even smaller, even more compact. These are also a lot cheaper. So uh, that kit that you're listening to now is about six or 700 quid. These, more like 200 pound a go. And the audio quality, I think, is about the same. They're also more compact. Though the downside is that they don't last as long, about two hours, I think, for these. However, they're great. And if you're looking for just a nice, easy, simple sound solution, and you're just recording one person at a time, I'd highly recommend these. They're fantastic. Or go for the Rode Wireless Go, which is very popular and could do some nice stuff like record from two sources at once. So you get, you know, two transmitters, one receiver. And that's something that is more complicated because you've got to get two of these. And that will do that. But um, I like Sennheiser stuff. It's just more durable. It just lasts longer. It's, it's nice. I like it. Um, this is easy to use. These don't have removable batteries either. That's a big difference between this and the kit that I'm using. That has removable batteries. Proprietary, but it does. And uh, yeah, I use XLRs a lot. One of the little differences, I know it's a silly thing, this kit, or the Sennheiser kit, has a screw thread for the microphones, so they will not come out by accident. Some of the Rode kit, you just clip in. So just a little tug like that, just a little bit of force, and your microphone's gonna come out. And again, if you don't know about that till the end of the day, you've lost a whole day's footage. It's, it's, it's gone, it's dead. And that's just frustrating. So then before I wrap up, the only other thing I suppose to mention is the software and hardware that I use. I'm gonna do a video talking about the big fancy wall PC that you normally see behind me, but I'm away at the moment, so I'm using my laptop, which is a two-year-old Razer. It's very good, but you know, it, it, nothing spectacular. Um, I have, however, recently changed software, and I may do a video about that, but that's gonna be a jam, friends. I know you're not gonna be that interested in talking about edit software. I actually began using Avid Media Composer, which is pretty hardcore. Very quickly changed to Adobe Premiere Pro. However, recently, Premiere has let itself down, so I've actually switched to using DaVinci Resolve, 
which I've been putting off for years. Everyone told me use DaVinci, use DaVinci, use DaVinci, and I tried it a few times and it just wasn't ready as edit software, but the new version 18 is, is actually pretty good. I've actually been enjoying it. The last few videos you've seen on the channel for the last couple of weeks, they've all been edited on DaVinci. And if you haven't noticed, that means it's doing its job. So there we go. I hope you've enjoyed that. If you have any questions, please hop into the comment section down below. That's, I think, a reasonably thorough overview of all the kit that I currently use to make these videos. And I promise you, in the next one, I'll be putting them back to good use, making more stuff about cars. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.